All right, so this morning, <clears throat> I'm actually be preaching on, on the subject of staying positive and avoiding depression. Now, I know a lot of my sermons aren't very positive oriented. I, you know, I preach on sin quite a bit and we preach on things that are, that are helpful in our life. But this is something that, you know, that everybody deals with. Everybody deals with hard times. Everybody goes through times of grief and sorrow and sadness. And I'm not one of those, you know, prosperity gospel preachers. I'm not one always up here just saying, oh, everything's just great. Everything's just fine. And you don't just come in just to get a feel good message. But it is important that we don't get so wrapped up in things that are bad, or that we don't allow grief and sorrow to overcome us and to overtake us and to bring us into a pit of despair. We will be very ineffective as, as you know, um, workers for Jesus Christ when we allow that to happen. And, and I'm telling you, it's easy to happen. Uh, it, it's, there's a lot of people I know, and actually one of the things that prompted this sermon is because I, I found out about a man that I know not very well, not a very close friend or anything, but recently he's taken his own life. He's committed suicide. Okay? And... It's one of the, you know, the, the whole concept of suicide is very mind-boggling because you just wonder sometimes how could somebody get to the point to where they feel like that's their only solution, that is their only option, is to just take their own life. Now, this man, I don't, like I said, I don't know him very well, but he's actually come and visited our church before. And I know that he's been listening to sermons, and, and I believe he was, he was a saved guy, he was a good guy, you know, he had some other issues going on apparently in his life. And you wonder how could somebody that's that's you know, I mean, a, a Christian guy, a good guy, get to the point to where he's taking his life. And it, it's hard to fathom. It's, it's hard to deal with that. But what I want to preach on this morning is, is how you can avoid getting to that state ever, hopefully, that you could never get to the point to where you feel like all is lost and the only option that you have would be to end your life for yourself. Now, I want to start off by first saying there's nothing wrong with grieving, with being sad, with having sorrow of heart. We live in a world today where people try to tell you that, you know, if you're sad for longer than like a couple days or a week, then you need to get on this pill. You need to get on this drug because you just need to be happy. The world just kind of exalts happiness and just say, okay, well, you know, if, if whatever makes you happy, then that's just fine. And that's the philosophy that the world tends to put out there is just, well, just do whatever makes you happy as if happy is just this great virtue above all else that we just need to live our lives in happiness and that is not true and you know this is that mindset that that is actually damaging to people who are going through grief who are causing self because people say no 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 you, you shouldn't be that sad well look there's many situations in many cases where it is right to be grieving it is right to be sad and it is right to grieve for for extended periods of time for example if someone were to lose say a young child right that is a very, very, very grievous event to happen in life. Now, I don't expect that person all of a sudden just be happy a week later and just to have everything just fine, or even a month later. Maybe not even a year later. I mean, there, the, these things can happen, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with going through a grieving process and being able to, to have that emotion. Don't let people tell you that you know, oh, there's just something wrong with you. Oh, you, you're suffering from depression. And, and this is what's happening today. People, you know, will have these devastating life events, whether it be death, whether, you know, any, there's a lot of things that can happen to people that can cause you to, to have extreme grief and sorrow. And doctors these days will be telling you, oh, as if it's just a sin, well, you're sad, so here's a pill and this will make you happy. And that's, and, and it's foolishness. It's foolishness. Look, I've known plenty of people that have gotten on these drugs, these Prozac stuff. It, it's mind-altering. It, it changes who they are. I've seen it happen. These drugs will change who they are. They, they become, uh, you know, it, it might sound kind of funny, but almost like a zombie. Like, like they're in this, this they're, they're, they're doped up. They're drugged out. And you could say, oh, well, this is a prescription pill. This is okay because the doctor prescribes it and it's legal in this country. These pills that just make you happy... They're doing the same things that the illegal drugs do, essentially. 
Slightly different side effects, but you know, they're, they're, they're impacting the same part of the brain. The serotonin and, and you know, these, these other um, neurotransmitter inhibitors that, that they're releasing, um, and I know I'm not saying that quite right, but forgive me for that. I do know how it works, but I'm, I'm not finding the right terms right now. But it doesn't matter because the, the, the drugs of today are doing the same exact thing. The, the solution to your problems with grief is not drugs. It's not that the, you know, the doctor's not going to be able to prescribe that. There are things that, that we need to be able to get through in our life. And there's, you know, there's, there's, there's high points and there's valleys. We need to be able to get through those valleys, get through those low points and come out um, stronger. And this is why we started out in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Because I wanted to point this out to you. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, A good name is better than precious ointment in the day of death than the day of one's birth. Verse 2, It is better... It is better to go to the house of mourning. What's mourning? It's sadness. It's grieving. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. Why? For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Verse 3, sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of thy countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. There's nothing wrong with grieving. He's saying, look, and, and you think about this, you, you might be a little bit perplexed. Say, why, why is sorrow better than laughter? Why, why is that? Why, is, why does the Bible saying that right here? Why is the, the heart of the wise in the house of mourning? Well, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, was a man of sorrows, and he was acquainted well with grief. In, in Isaiah, let's just turn there, Isaiah 53. I don't know if I have that in my notes or not. Actually, I think I do. Isaiah 53, but I'll skip ahead. That's fine. Turn forward in your Bible just a little bit to Isaiah 53. And in the book of Proverbs, too, it, it tells us that you know, with, with wisdom and with knowledge is going to come some grief. You start to understand, you're, you're gonna, you're, when you understand more about sin and how it impacts people and, and just about God in general, you know, it's, it's, it can bring sadness. Because, you know, the Bible says that the, the excuse me, in Ecclesiastes, the, the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. See, there's a lot of people that they, they might be happy, they might look happy, but if they're a fool, you know, they're a fool. And there's, there's, you know, that's not going to end up doing them any good. You know, in Ecclesiastes, there's a lot of talk about vanity, and we're all going to, you know, all, we all experience the same thing. We're all going to die, you know. There's a, everyone does all kinds of different things with their life, but we're all going to die one day. And what good is that happiness, that mirth going to do you if you're a fool? If, you know, the Bible says the fool said in his heart, there is no God. And if you, don't, if you don't have salvation, if you don't have Christ, then that happiness is meaningless, it's vain. But um, look at Isaiah 53, verse number 3, talking about Jesus Christ. The Bible reads, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. If we are l truly going to try to follow Christ and walk in Christ's footsteps, we would be fooling ourselves to think that we also won't be in contact with sorrows and we also won't come into contact with grief. Jesus Christ was despised. He was afflicted. He was rejected of men. People hated him. I mean, constantly there's people conspiring to try to kill him. And they ended up doing so. After only three and a half years of his ministry, he was end up being put to death. People were lying about him. You know, people were treating him poorly, trying to kill him. Why? Why were they doing all this? It's because of what he said. It's because of what he said and what he did. Because he was obeying the Father, and he was going around, he was preaching God's word, he was not withholding the truth from anybody, he was speaking the truth, and he was testifying of the world and the wickedness that is therein, 
And that is why the world in general, by and large, hated him. Because he spake the truth. Because he was shining a light on the darkness. He was shining a light into the dark places where people don't want to have the light exposed. Those Pharisees and those Sadducees, they didn't want that light shining on their hypocrisy and shining on their wickedness and shining on their wicked deeds. And a lot of people don't like that. And, you know, the, Jesus Christ himself said, if they call the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call you? So look, they called Jesus Christ the devil. So we would be remiss to think that if we are actually truly going to follow Jesus Christ, if we're going to preach his word, if we're going to do what's right and follow him, that they're not going to say you know, similar things about us or even worse things against us. And that's going to bring grief. It's going to bring sorrow. So you know, we can't just have this concept that you're always going to be having just joy all the time in your life and never have grief and never have sorrow. Jesus Christ is a great example of someone who is well acquainted with grief, well acquainted with sorrows. And yet he continued to do what he did. And he did it out of love. He did it for us. You know, not for his own sake. He did it for us. But let's um, turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. There's a lot of reasons why people have sorrow. You know, of course, that it's totally normal and expected. Sometimes our sorrow is caused by things that are outside of our control. Right? Devastations of a death or, or accidents and, and things that happen that's just completely outside of our control. But sometimes we can be very grieved as a result of our own sin. And if you remember uh, when Peter, the Apostle Peter, rejected Christ, when he denied Christ those three times, right? After Jesus said, you know, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And the, the same night that Jesus was arrested, what happened? People said, hey, wait, weren't you, aren't you one of, one of his followers? Weren't you, didn't I see you in the garden? He did, no, 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 I don't know what you're talking about, right? To the point where he started cursing and swearing, I know not the man. You know, I don't know him. And then he heard the cock crow. That reminded him of what Jesus said. And what did he do? The Bible says he went out and he wept bitterly. A bitter weeping. He was extremely grieved and saddened and he was mourning because of his own. So he finally realized, man, I'm in, I'm in great sin. I just denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I'm going to tell you, there's nothing wrong with having that. It's actually a good thing to have. You're in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. When we realize that we're in sin, when we find out that there's something that we've done that's against God and we see it in the Bible, look, don't have the stiff neck. Don't have the rebellious attitude that just says, oh, well, I'm okay anyways. I don't, you know, I don't care what that says. And just try to blow it off or try to justify and make excuses for your sin. Peter could have been like, oh, well, I'm sure God understands. You know, I mean, like, I mean, what do you expect? You're going to put me to death if I say I was with him and try to justify and rationalize his sin. But that's not what he did. Instead, he got sorry. He grieved about it. And that's where our true repentance is going to come from when we grieve and are sorrowful at the sins that we commit. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 8. The Bible reads, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry though it were but for a season. So what Paul's saying here, this is the second letter, the second epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. In the first letter he wrote, he was calling them out on all kinds of sins. Right? He's saying, look, you've got this wrong, you've got this problem in your church, I've already judged, you know, I don't even have to be there, you need to get this fixed. And what he's saying is, I made you sorry with the letter. When they, when they read that, they were sorry. And he says, I don't repent. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me. I'm not changing my mind that I wrote that letter to you. He says, though I did repent. So at first, when you know, he was kind of like, oh man, maybe I was a little too harsh on him. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have wrote that. He's saying, no. He says, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. He said, I'm not happy that you were just sad. I'm not happy that you were just made sorry. He says, but, in verse 9, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, 
that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. This is, so this is all the good things that could come of, of a godly type of sorrow. Verse 11. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So he's saying, look, at first I was kind of, you know, I kind of repented. I was just like, man, maybe I shouldn't have wrote that letter. But then he's saying, no, I don't repent. I'm glad I wrote it. And I'm not glad because you just had grief or sorrow of heart, but I'm glad because that sorrow caused you to make a change, to repent, to get right, to get more zealous, to get, you know, have more fear, to have this, this um, carefulness. Looking at the things that you do much more carefully and say, you know, no, we're going to do what's right in God's eyes. And, and taking that grief and using it as an impetus to change your life. This is what we need. See, when you, get, when you do sins, Elizabeth, sit over there. When you commit sins in your life, you ought to be grieved. It ought to, to, to bring you sorrow. But don't just wallow in that. Again, the Apostle Peter is a great example. He didn't just quit. He didn't say, oh man, I denied Christ. You know, uh, and get so upset that he just, just left it all. He said, well, forget it. Now I can't serve God at all. I'm just defeated. You know, Satan is one. And now I'm just going to go and be a fisherman. Is that what he did with the rest of his life? No. He got back up on his feet. He, he grieved as he should have. But then from that point forward, do you think he ever denied Christ again? Because uh -oh. I don't think so. I mean, it's not recorded in Scripture, but I, don't, I mean, nothing that we see in Scripture would, would, would let, let us think that he would ever got to the point where he was denying Christ. I mean, you know, history tells us that he was martyred for Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that. That he was, he was martyred for Jesus Christ. He didn't deny him when it came down to death at the end of his life. He didn't deny Christ. But he did that one time. And see, that's the thing. Grief can cause you and can lead you to, especially when it comes from your sin, to get out of church. And, I, and you know, I've seen this happen too many times, especially with younger believers, with newer believers. You know, they might get excited. They're believing in Christ. They come to church and then like, you know, they're struggling with a, with a, a certain sin in their life. And then they keep failing and failing, and, you know, and they're trying, but they keep failing. And they just say, well, you know what? I just, they just forget it and they give up. And that is like the worst thing that you can do is to just give up. We need to be coming to church. But before I even get into that point, if you're in, you're in 2 Corinthians 7, flip back to chapter 2 real quick. I'm getting slightly ahead of myself because we don't want to get swallowed up in over much sorrow. We don't want these these sins, we don't want this to, to bring us to the point to where we're just completely knocked out. We want it to bring us to the point where we're going to change, we're going to repent, we're going to start doing what's right. But look at verse number 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 6 says, Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. So Paul's saying, look, this guy's paid enough. This guy that was in sin, this guy that's been doing wrong, you know, the punishment's sufficient. He's saying, now you need to forgive him. You need to comfort him. And this is why church is important. Because he's speaking to the church. And he's talking about a specific church member. He's saying, look, that guy's paid enough. He's been through enough. Now you need to forgive him. Now you need to comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. It's important to stay in church and it's important for the church members to be aware of what's going on in people's life so that they can keep an eye out for someone who might seem to be getting swallowed up in over much sorrow. We need to be on the lookout for that so that we can be comforting and we can be forgiving to people um, as is warranted. And um, 
watching out so that other church members don't get swallowed up. Look at what he says in verse 8. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan is using his devices of getting people grieved and getting people sorrowed and trying to get them swallowed up in overmuch grief and too much grief. So he's saying, look, we know that Satan's going to try to get people to the point to where they're so sad and they're so distressed that they're just going to get out of church. They're just going to get out of you know, fellowship with God and, and fellowship with people. We as a church need to be on the lookout for that and be able to, to help to edify people, to comfort people, to be there as a support line for them so that they don't get swallowed up so that Satan doesn't get an advantage over us. Now, extreme sorrow is a problem for some people, and there's many tragic things, as, as I was talking about earlier. You know, pressures in life can slowly build and build and build, and you can feel like there's just one thing stacking up upon another and upon another to the point to where you just get, feel like you're an inch from losing it. You just feel like you can't take it anymore. Now, as I mentioned earlier, so some people get to that point and they feel like the only solution is ending their life. Now, I want to mention this. We here at Word of Truth Baptist Church believe that salvation is a free gift. We believe salvation is given to us because Jesus Christ took our sins upon Himself when He went to that cross. He died on that cross, rose, rose again from the dead. And the Bible says in Acts 16, it says, you know, there's a question asked, it says, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. We believe salvation is that simple. It's a free gift. It's bought and paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. Once you receive that gift, you have eternal life. You have everlasting life, which by definition means forever. It doesn't end. You have eternal life. It's a gift. It's paid for. It's given to you. Once you have that life, it's yours. And, you know, a lot of people, when we go out, I talk to people all the time about the gospel of Christ. And they'll say, well, wait a minute. You know, if you tell people that, then that means, you know, like, because I'll say, you know, look, even if I sin, I'm still saved. I'm saved because Christ paid for my sins, because Christ died for me. Not because I'm a great person, not because I'm obedient to the law. For by the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, the Bible says. So we need to, you know, when, when people will say that, they'll say, well, wait a minute. You know, you're saying that if someone sins, then they could just, they're still going to go to heaven. Yes, because that's what the gospel is, because it's a bought and paid for gift. Well, that just, you know, you can't tell people that, though. I've, I've had people tell me this. You can't tell people that because then they'll just, they'll just go off and sin. Well, look, no, I can tell people that because it's the truth, because Jesus Christ is the complete payment for our sins. What he did is sufficient. And that extends all the way to people taking their own life in suicide. And... I'm not going to say that if a person takes their own life, they're no longer saved just to try to get them not to kill themselves. Okay? I'm not going to do it because it's not the truth. The truth of the matter is, even something that as, as drastic as suicide, taking your own life, hey, if you're a child of God, if you're born again, you've been sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, you are God's child. You cannot be unborn. Your spirit cannot be unborn. You're born again. You're a child of God. Jesus paid for every sin, including suicide, including murder, including every single sin. Jesus Christ paid for all of them. So even someone that gets to that point, now look, I'm completely against suicide. I'm completely against murder. I'm completely against taking your own life. That's not right. It's the wrong thing. But I'm not going to lie to a person and say that that will send you to hell. The Bible does not say that's an unforgivable sin. Nowhere. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that. The Bible says that, you know, Christ has paid for all our sins. So once he's paid for them, they're paid for. Now look, there's a lot of things that I don't like about suicide. Obviously, you know, it's damaging. 
you know, every time you sin, it affects other people. And the worst thing about suicide is that people get so wrapped up in themselves that they stop thinking about how it's going to impact other people. The, the damage done to those are left because, you know, and, and even in the case that I'm talking about, you know, there's people that love that person. Every single person who has contact with a, in a person's life where they've taken their own life always starts thinking, what could I have done? What did I not do right? How could they do that? You know, like, like, I failed. I did something wrong. And they're going to blame themselves for, for what they did. And that's, a, that's an extreme burden and guilt laid upon a person when, you know, when the other person takes their life. And it's not fair to those people. It's not fair to, you know, if you have children, it's not fair to them. It's not fair to, to a lot of people. And you're just, you know, taking, by taking your own life, you end up hurting so many other people. And look, it's wrong. It's a sin. But if somebody has received Christ, if someone is born again, they still are saved. Because you cannot lose your salvation because it's everlasting life. It's eternal. If God made a promise and he tells you something's eternal, then you better believe that it's eternal. Look at this example of Job. Job is such a great example of this. If you get to the point where you feel like, you know, and Job is just before the book of Psalms, Job chapter 1. We're going to see what happens to Job. Because a lot of us can get to that point to where you think, I can't take it. There's, just, there's one thing after another after another. Everything's going wrong in my life. Now, we've already seen where, um, you know, our own sin can bring us grief, right? Our own sin, the things that we can do, that we do, can, can cause that to happen to us. We are the ones that are solely responsible for that grief when we sin against God and, and, and you know, we bring that upon ourselves. But Job was an example of someone who didn't do that. Job chapter 1, verse number 1 says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So according to the Bible here, the Bible says that Job was an upright man. He feared God. He eschewed evil. He basically did as right. It goes on about his, about his uh, substance and the things that he had. He, he had a lot of wealth. He had a big family. But then what happens? Satan goes to God. Satan goes to the Lord. And he's saying, you know what? He's basically tempting him. He's saying, you know, does Job fear God for not? You know, you know, haven't you just been protecting him? And that's the only reason why he's worshiping you and serving you. So um, God says, okay, you know, behold, all that he hath, in verse 12, he says, behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell me. So this is starting off to be a bad day for Job. His oxen and his asses, right? He's got, he's got a lot of wealth with the oxen and the asses. He's like, okay, look, the, the band of the Sabians, they came in, they killed them, and they killed your servants too. I mean, the, the men that were out there watching them, they all got slaughtered. They all got killed. He lost all of that. Verse 16, while he was yet speaking. So this guy's just telling him this bad news. There came also another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I only am escaped alone telling. So first he loses ox and ass and now he's losing all of his sheep and here he's saying it's the fire of God from heaven. You know, the other one, it's like, okay, well, these guys came and they made an attack and, you know, they're wicked men and they're, you know, they're stricken. Now all of a sudden it's like, how do you explain this? The only explanation it seems to be is that God's doing it. But is God doing this? No. Satan's attacking. But it looks like it's coming from God. So now all of his sheep are burned up. Verse 17, While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, 
and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. He loses all of his wealth, his ox, his asses, his sheep, and his camels. And if you could say all of that, you could say, okay, you know, financially I've been ruined. But then it comes down to his ten children. All ten of his children in one place. All of them. Not even just one. One would be sad enough. All ten of his children. Dead. And this all happens back to back. I mean, there's just... The Bible's not, not, you know, er, nothing's in here by accident. It says, while he was yet speaking means these guys, it was all planned and lined up so that they are getting to him just one after another. He's just being hit and hit and hit. And it's like, that's the knockout punch. Mm -hmm. All of your kids are dead. But look at the way, look at how Satan is able to plan things. We need to be aware of that also. Satan's level of, of, of being able to conspire and plan an event like this. He carried that out. And he's going to try to attack and get people. Now look, Job was like the best man living on earth, so Satan had his sights on him. And when he had his sights on him, he really let him have it. We need to be aware of these things, for one, because... You can't always assume that it's just you, you know, it's because of something you did. I mean, Job, throughout all these chapters, he's saying, look, this isn't, you know, like, I didn't do anything wrong. Like, I didn't do anything to, to, to deserve all of this. But what he failed to realize was that it was literally just an attack from Satan. But look at Job's attitude in, in all of this. After everything that was done. Verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. He had that integrity and that faith in the Lord just saying, Look, all these things that I even had, the only reason I had these things is because it was given to me by God. And he said, God gave me all this stuff and he's decided to take it away. Well, God is still blessed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And honestly, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because if you can have this type of an attitude, this can help you. Now look, was Job grieved? Of course, of course he was sad, saddened and sorrowed. And he was so sad that when his friends came to visit him, they didn't even talk to him. For a long time, for a few days, they, they, they didn't even say a word to him because they saw how extremely sad he was. But Job was able to make it through this because he still had an attitude that said, it's, it's a humble attitude, the attitude that just says, you know what? All of this stuff that I have, God's blessed me with it, but it can be gone tomorrow. It can be here today, gone tomorrow. Everything that we have could be burned up. So, for one, if you lose things, like, like when you have bad things happen to you, you lose you know, maybe a big thing like a vehicle or, or part of your house, or you know, financially you get ruined. Something that will help you get through that is having the, a Job type of an attitude. Just where we can look at it with the proper perspective and just say, for one, none of this stuff really matters. Now, I know I'm going to get to his kids in a minute because that's, that's kind of another level, right? But with all the financial stuff, you could say, look, God's given me all this stuff and it's been great, but it's all going to get burned up anyways. I mean, we're only on this, this earth for a short period of time and when we're gone, hey, none of this stuff's going to matter anyways. It's all going to stay down here on earth. And ultimately, one day, God's going to just send fire and brimstone upon this whole earth and destroy it. So everything, all the works, all the things that you do down here, it's all going to be gone. It's vanity. It does, it's not going to matter. So we shouldn't hold so tightly to it to where that's going to ruin us if we lose it. Right? 
We need to set our minds on things in heaven above. Now, I believe what, you know, one of the things that he could, uh, the solace or comfort he could have with his own children being lost. Job was an upright man. I guarantee you he, he brought up his family in the ways of the Lord. We, we see, um, we saw in the chapter earlier, well, we didn't read it, but, um, you know, Job was, was offering sacrifices and just saying, you know, just in case my kids did something wrong. You know, he was a God-fearing man. And again, when we have eternal life, it's not like he's never going to see those kids again. If his children were saved, if his children put their faith on God, they're not here physically, right? They weren't there physically or taken away, but it doesn't mean he's not going to see them again and spend eternity with them. That's the comfort and the solace that we can have is that, you know, with people, with things like our children, you know, or, or other loved ones, is that if they're saved, you get to spend an eternity with them and that it's, it's just a temporary departure. Also remember this, you know, the story of Job and what we read about Jesus because sometimes when you get in these places of great despair, even just knowing that you're not alone, can be helpful. It can be somewhat comforting. When you are going through some of the worst trials and troubles in your life, think about how bad Job had it. I still have yet to this day to have met a person that has had things happen so bad as what Job went through. Now, you know, again, maybe I, I don't know every individual's experience and what they've done and what they've been through or anything like that. But Job had, I mean, this is, this is pretty serious. This is pretty extreme. And because it doesn't even stop there. Then, then he attacks his health. Then he's covered with all these boils and sores and, and everything else. After he's lost everything else, he doesn't even have his health anymore and he loses that. So now he's just miserable all the time because he's dealing with, you know, just, just itchiness and sores and boils and just, just everything, right? And he's being disdained. People are looking down on him. His friends come in and they're saying, oh yeah, you must be in such, such great grievous sin because you have all this stuff happening. They even say, they bring up his children. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, like he's, he's lost all of his kids and you're going to say, oh yeah, they must have been in this great sin. Come on, that's not a good feel. That's not going to comfort that person. How can you call yourself a friend and comfort that man when you, when you bring up things like that? And you can read through the book. You know, they're just railing on him basically the whole time. He doesn't have it. He's not in good shape. Even his wife, even his, his own wife says, you know, why don't you just curse God and die? Like, just get it over with. He's got nobody in his corner. He's all alone. But he pulled through. And God ended up blessing him in the latter end. We need to, to endure our trials and our troubles and this hardship. You don't know what, you know, it looks really bad at the moment you're in that. When you're in, when you're in the worst of it. Things, you know, it could look like you have no hope. But you don't know what God has in store for you just a little bit later, just on the other side. We need to be able to stick through it. And, and if you do find yourself in such great, you know, tragic circumstances and, you, and you're very grieved, think about a man like Job. And think about how it ended up working out for him. You say, well, I don't even see how anything can work out for me because such and such happened. You can't always see those things. You can't see the great things that God has planned for you. Hey, do you believe that God is capable of performing miracles? Just because you can't understand how God can do something doesn't mean he can't do it. Abraham and Sarah didn't understand how in the world Sarah can have a child when she's 90 years old. They're like, it's impossible. I can't have a child. It's pat, you know, I'm a, the, the things that happen in a female's body, she's like, you know, I'm past the age. But God made it happen. She was even able to nurse her child. You say, well, how can that even be? Because God can perform miracles. But we need to have the faith. So if you can't see how things can ever possibly get better for your life, don't even dwell on that. 
God can make things. Look, if God be for us, who can be against us? He can make these things happen. This is, this is where we need to find our source of hope and our source of comfort to get us through. Now look, I, as far as I know, I don't think anybody's having such terrible times of grief in their life right now. But, but keep these things in mind. Keep them with you. And maybe you know someone who's going through this stuff. Share some of this information, but keep this with you so that you don't get to that point of, of utter you know, being over much grieved and being swallowed up. Now, um, turn if you would to Proverbs chapter 23. There's a couple things I want to touch on that, that people will try to fix their problems and they'll try to deal with their sorrow and their sadness in certain ways and, and it's not going to help at all. One of the ways that people will choose to try to deal with extreme grief is to turn to alcohol or turn to drugs. And again, I can throw the, the antidepressants in the same category, but, but let's talk about alcohol specifically because Proverbs 23 mentions that. You know, there's a lot of people, you heard the expression, people drowning their sorrows, right? They say, I'm really, I'm really upset and I'm really sad, so I'm just going to drink because it's going to numb my pain, because I don't want to feel this pain, I just want it to be numb. But the, the, the problem with that, the big problem with that is that that alcohol is going to cause you more sorrow. You don't even, you think you're just numbing your pain, because you get that instant gratification for a second, but in the long run, that's going to cause you even more sorrows. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, verse 29, who hath woe? Woe is very extreme sadness. Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? That's fightings. Who hath babbling, saying stupid things? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. All of those things. Now look, you can say, oh no, that, you know, this is saying that who has sorrow, those that, those that tarry long at the wine, that's why they're tarrying long. No, no, no. Understand what this is saying. The, the who hath sorrow is the result. Because you could look at, look at all the things in that sentence. They're all talking about the result of drinking the alcohol. Who hath babbling, right? People don't, people don't start babbling and just saying stupid things and that causes them to drink. No, it's the other way around. They start drinking and then people start saying stupid things. They start saying things they never would say if they weren't drunk, right? That's what babbling is. Same thing with who hath wounds without cause. People just get hurt. And look, I can testify to this. Okay, I used to be real big in alcohol. And I've woken up days and I've had blood on my jeans. I've had blood from, from wounds. And I wake up and I'm like, how did that happen? Don't know. Because I was drunk, because I was blacked out, because who knows what happened. This is what happens. Wounds without, you know, people don't have wounds without cause and then they go and drink. Who hath redness of eyes? That's a, again, it's a physical attribute result of, of tarrying long at the wine, of drinking wine and getting drunk. You get red eyes. So who hath woe and who hath sorrow? Again, those are results of drinking according to God's word. Now look, you could say, well, that's not true. Well, then the Bible's not true. Do you believe God's word or not? The Bible says it's going to bring you more sorrow. Don't try to fix your problems with booze. It's only going to hurt you worse. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cause you more problems. Um, yes, I'll read from you. You don't have to turn there. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Because other people will think that you know, money's the answer. People say, well, I'm really sad. I'm really upset. And sometimes, and, and you, we all probably experience this. You, know, you buy something. You buy a new gadget. You buy something that's kind of fun. And you know, it kind of lifts your spirits. You're kind of happy. You're like, oh, cool. I got this new cool thing. Wow, isn't this neat? This is exciting. Right? And you get this, this feeling of, of joy. Right? It is, it's, it's a temporary thing, but you get this feeling and you start thinking, wow, that's, that's really neat. I like, you, you get a new car, you get a new boat, you get you know, something big, like, man, this is great. But what happens? It starts to fade. Right? It starts to, eh. It's funny because we were just talking about this the other day. I was talking with my wife. There was, um, a garage sale down the street 
and they had this this I guess this nice I didn't even see it. I guess it was some like nice playhouse or something for the kids. And my wife's like, hey, you should go down there and check and see how much it is. And I'm like, look, anyone who's seen my backyard knows like like we're pretty full. <laughs> we've got a playhouse, we've got a trampoline, we've got you know the swimming pool, we've got all this stuff, right? Because we love I mean we like getting things for the kids. We love them, we want them to have a lot of fun. But I, I said, do you remember when we first got that playhouse? Because she said, well, that playhouse is just like a box anyways. Let's get this other one. I said, do you remember when we got this? And we said, man, how cool is this thing? This is like, I mean, I never had anything like this as a kid. It's got two stories. It's got a slide. It's got this stuff. You know, and, and we're like so excited about it. And now it's just like a box, <laughs> right? <laughs> but that's just, I mean, that's just how it is. You get things and, and you know, the, the joy kind of wears off. The newness wears off. Right? It's like, eh, yeah, we've had this for a few years now. It's just like, okay, well, whatever. I'm done with it. And that's how, you know, money and things are. They're vanity. You, know, you, you may get that temporary fix, but that is not a solution. And, and really, that's not something you want to be spending your time on. So if you have this problem and you feel like, because, and look, this happens to people. People run themselves into all kinds of debt because... They're grieving because they're sorrow and, and they're trying to make up for that. And okay, so they don't turn to the alcohol, but they're turning to something else. They're turning to spending money to try to just make themselves feel a little bit better for a while. And that becomes their drug. 1 Timothy 6 verse 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Does that sound familiar? Sound like the attitude Job had? It's the exact same thing. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich, that this means those that want to be rich, those that are looking for having money, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, listen to this, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Going after that money and, and trying to obtain all this stuff and having that love of that money is going to make you sorrowful. It's going to bring you more sadness. Again, and this is how sin works. You have that little, just like with the alcohol, that little temporary relief, that little temporary pick-me-up, that little fix, that little band-aid for the problem but in this case, like these band-aids are making the wound even bigger. They're making it even worse. It's not a fix. It's not a solution. We need to keep these things in mind so we don't get <clears throat> steered down the wrong path in trying to fix our problems and trying to fix our depression or, or the, the sadness that we're dealing with. You're in Proverbs, right? Turn to Proverbs 27, verse 17. Proverbs 27, 17. And I mentioned this earlier, you know, the worst thing for you to do is to get out of church. You need to stay in church. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So what it's saying here, you know, the countenance is your face, right? You sharpen the countenance of your friend's face. You know, iron sharpens iron. You want to come here among godly friends, among people who are going to be able to help lift you up. Hebrews 10, you don't have to turn there, but I'll just read it for you. Turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to John 16. John chapter 16. I'm almost done here. John 16. In Hebrews 10, the Bible says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need church so much more because we need exhortation so much more from other people, from other believers, because as the day approaches, as the day of Christ approaches, we know that perilous times are going to come. We know that things are going to get worse and worse in this world. We know that persecution is going to get is going to rise. We could see it already. You can see the persecution in this country against Christianity just just starting to blow up. And you're going to have a lot more hard times to come. 
We need to be prepared for these hard times and part of the assembling of ourselves together will help with the exhortation with each other. Um, Galatians 5, you know, another way to, to try to keep your, your sorrow or grief at bay is to walk in the Spirit. And this, is, this was our text, ver our memory verse. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit... So you're going to have the fruit of the Spirit when you're walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit means you're obeying God, you're doing what He wants you to do, and, and you're living the life that He's laid out for you to do when you're walking in the Spirit. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and you get happiness by walking in the Spirit, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So when you're walking, the, the Bible says if you're walking in the Spirit, which means you, you must be doing the things that He wants you to do. It's going to be preaching the gospel and getting sin out of your life and doing all of these things will help you to have more joy in your life. You're in John 16. Look at verse number 22. We need to pray. And this is an aspect that a lot of people don't, don't do as, mu as much as they shot to in their life. John 16 verse 22 says, And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive, look at this, that your joy may be full. We could bring our problems unto God and unto Christ and pray for His help and pray for these things. You know, when you have all these problems in your life, go to God. Pray for it. He says, ask and you shall receive. God doesn't want you living a miserable life. Now, sometimes we have to go through times of testing and trials, but God doesn't want you as His child. If you're born again, if you are a child of God, God doesn't want you just having a completely miserable life. The same way that I don't want my children to have a completely miserable life. Now, sometimes there are times when they have to go through that, right? Especially when they bring it on themselves. If they, if they get in some kind of a sin, if they do something that's, that's wrong, you know, they, they're going to have to reap what they sow. But as a father knowing, hey, there's an end to this. You know, they have to go through this because hopefully it'll, it'll, bring, it'll be godly sorrow that worketh repentance and it's needful for them. It's something that's going to strengthen them. It's something that's good for them. But it's not like I'm going to want them just in misery their whole life. You know, that's not going to do any good for them. So God is the same way with his children. He looks at you as his child and he says, look, ask and you'll receive. I'll give it to you. He says that your joy may be full. I want you to have a joyful life. And then um, the last point, turn if you would to to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The biggest problem that I see with, with people who are dealing with depression, and I mentioned this, I touched on this briefly earlier, is that the focus stays on you. You start dwelling on the bad things that happen, and you start thinking more and more about all of the bad that's happened to you. And it's almost like a downward spiral. The more you think about these things, the sadder you get. And you keep thinking, oh man, this happened to me and I lost this. And oh man, this is so bad. And your focus is all around yourself. That is only going to lead to more sorrow. But if you can have a thought of other people, and even in your times of, of your worst grief, you say, you know what? I've got all kinds of bad things happen, but, but how can I be a help to somebody else? You get your mind off of your own problems and your own miseries. Look, that in itself will help bring you some joy because you're not going to be dwelling on all the problems that you have when you're focused on somebody else. Not only that, when you can actually do good for somebody, and anyone who's done this knows, you start to feel good about, about what you've done to help them. It will literally make you feel better when you help other people. Psalm 126 verse 5 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. 
He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now, this is a verse, and you know, I believe this applies completely to sowing, to preaching the gospel, sowing the seed, sowing God's word, bringing God's word to other people. And anyone who's led anyone else to Christ before knows how much joy that actually brings you. When, when someone can bow their head and call upon God to save their souls because they're putting their faith in Jesus Christ for their, as their Savior, that is joyful because their, their existence has changed as one being hell-bound to one that's now going to spend an eternity with God in heaven. Their entire life has changed. And when you have a part in that, that will bring you joy. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse 19. The Bible says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming, for ye are our glory and joy. Again, he's talking about other people, people that have been won to Christ. You know, you're going to see those people again in heaven. That is going to bring you joy. We need to stop thinking about and worrying and focusing on ourselves, but think about, you know, the Bible says esteem others better than yourself. And when you can do that, it takes your mind off your own problems and it, and it won't, you know, you, it's not, it doesn't make the problems go away, but it can help you cope with it, help you deal with it. It gives you some more value and some more worth when you're helping other people. See, when people get to the point to where they're going to take their own life, it's because they think that there's nothing else for them to do. They feel like they're worthless. They feel like there's no way out of this situation. How can I possibly do anything good? But if you're doing good and helping other people, then you could start to say, well, wait a minute. If I were to kill myself, what's this person going to do? What's that person going to do that I'm helping out? I'm helping this person. Who's going to help that person out? They have nobody. And you, you're, you're giving yourself more value Hopefully you could think about those other people as well when you, uh, you know, if, if something were to get that severe for you. But by, by keeping yourself busy and focusing on other people, that will help you as well. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for the great comfort we could find in the Scripture, dear God. Even just knowing that we're not alone, like um, by thinking about the things that Job went through and, and even your son Jesus Christ went through, dear God. I pray that, that those things would be a comfort to us when we experience grief and sorrow. And Lord, we know that the devil's out is in trying to attack people and trying to get people filled, filled with over much sorrow. God, I don't know what's going on in anybody's life today, dear Lord, but I pray that, that as we leave here today, we wouldn't just forget about these words and, and about how to deal with with things that have gone wrong in our life, dear Lord, that we wouldn't get swallowed up with over much sorrow. And God, I pray that you would please help us as a church to be able to look upon the cares of other people and to, to watch out for, for someone that might be struggling with depression, with, with um, dealing with over much grief, dear God, that we can help to be a comfort and to help those people, dear Lord, to not let Satan get the advantage over us. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.